Welcome, I'm Armin Legrand, working for Allotropia, and I w just wanted to talk about uh, multicolor gradients, which I had the chance to do um, at last. So, for motivation, it's a long missing feature, and uh, an office package is not really up to date uh, when you don't have some. And I don't know any other package, even graphic packages, which doesn't support it nowadays. So I filed it as a tender a long time ago. The last version was in, on the 2021 wiki. You can check there, but I already copied that quite for some years. And everyone agreed that it's necessary, but it was never voted strong enough. Maybe it's my fault and the text was uh, not understandable enough because uh, I have my head on the technical side. Maybe a description was just too technical to get voted. I have no idea, um, but it's a too big task to do as a sidekick uh, to daily work, so not possible, uh, but I thought about the doability, of course, all the time, so I was prepared. And then, at last, support was offered, so Michael Meeks offered uh, sponsoring, Thorsten helped, Regina helped a lot, Heiko did some stuff, and uh, anyways, I dis discussed with Heiko nearly at every uh, meeting we had about doing it and how to do it and of course mostly the UI aspects with Heiko. Um, discussed with many colleagues and all that stuff uh, but now with that support I could really start doing it and it's uh, nearly completely uh, finished. I say nearly completely because time and uh, support ran out to do the UI stuff. So it's complete in the core you will see uh, but uh, we have no uh, current UI. It, it's a compromise. Uh, so let's go into changes made. Commits go from 10th of February to 30th of June. Uh, uh, I tagged everything with MCGR in big letters. I like to do stuff like that. I did it also for the system dependent renderers. It's just easy to grab. Um, but it's not only done by me, Regina helped a lot. I, I really have to thank Regina, she was helpful, she bombarded me with bugs and stuff. And But every, every of her mentionings or bugs was immediately reproducible, so really useful. I have to uh, give her a big thank you, I already did. Um, so it's mainly stable, uh, just uh, some small stuff was coming up, but, but uh, nas nothing uh, big. and. Uh, you can have a look at the commit comments. I usually comment quite, quite, quite a lot and uh, talk about the environment where the changes happen. And you, you can uh, read between the lines about the connections in the office if you want. Uh, good, good uh, possibility to have deeper understanding of, of the office components how they work together. If you ask me, so. It's 44 commits in total, I think. Uh, maybe uh, not all were tagged correctly. So this is the first half, this is the second half, but don't worry, we will not continue with that. Um, I will first start with uh, lessons learned from doing it, uh, because I don't know if I will have time at the end to do it, so I'll do it at the start. Um, the changes in refined new code were much simpler, safer, faster, stable, less error prone, sustainable uh, in single places than in older parts, of course. But uh, we should really talk about the consequences of, of stuff like that. Uh, we should think more about refactoring code, if you ask me. In the long term, this will save much time and nerves and keep people motivated and we are we are fighting to get people into development and our code base is not inviting, I would say. Um, so it's also much safer. And yes, I know that it's hard to get commercial funding for stuff like that because you, normally you get commercial funding only for fancy stuff which plops up, plops up and shows something and gives you some applause and new feature. But in principle, we have a building where, where the fundament is really getting old and we have a shiny front and entrance. So it's for the long term, it's not good. So um, what came in handy, I used just an environment variable, uh, name, name is not important. Um, to just easily uh, be able to test my stuff and to get it in the master early. 
Um, so you can experiment anytime with just one build. Uh, you can switch it on by, by putting it in front of your S office starting command. Uh, I'm sure everyone uh, here knows that. And I highly recommend this, but you have, of course, be careful when you don't finish a feature, you have to remove your stuff again. That's important. So let's get to the core changes. I have a lot of slides, so we'll, I will not talk about all of them, but of the most important and interesting ones. So of course, it's, it's, it's not matching. It's just uh, the move from a start color and color to a vector with offset and color. Uh, so the basic change was not really complicated. It has some com complicated effects. You can have combinations of color stops, which are encouraging, uh, but that's not the real problem. The real problem is to get it done uh, throughout all the office in principle. So th this gave a good anchor to identify places. Uh, uh, need now a vector of colors to be compatible. I, was strongly uh, taking care to always have a start and color um, fallback. So at least virtually, because uh, the, for example, the, the basic core class um, does really not have a start and color anymore because uh, from the color stop vector, you can calculate it now. So there's really no member anymore in the basic data class. So. Uh, you need to handle all existing API accesses as fallbacks to, to keep compatible and add new API for vector ready to be used. And so uh, the offset part of the vector is just a unified double value. It's easiest. You don't have to divide anything. You can uh, multiply whatever you need when you later have to scale it somehow for UI or whatever. Uh, number of entries is not limited. It's sorted by offsets and multiple, multiple entries with the same offset are allowed. So this requires an order preserving sort to keep it. Uh, so it would be unfortunate and break and not work if entries at the same position would be exchanged by the sort. Luckily, the standard sort does it. So uh, zero and one not mandatory, uh, already mentioned, uh, you have to handle uh, incoming stuff for uh, error corrections uh, below uh, zero and above one. So um, uh, just details, you, you can make um, just a line linear uh, uh, calculation to get the right start and color. I, I could have also chosen to say it's just an error and ignore uh, input from the user outside of that range. But I strongly um, opt for not throwing away any user input and make the most usable out of it, even if it looks, looks unusable. So the, the color part is basic, basic GFX B color, also in unit range. Uh, so we will be uh, compatible to everything which comes along. Um, precision more than eight bits stuff and stuff like that. It's getting more uh, actual and more current uh, in displays and stuff like that. And uh, one of a big paradigm difference to uh, the MS stuff is uh, LibreOffice has a different concept for the transparency. So for all fields we have, you can additionally define the transparency and that transparency can be uh, uh, linear or uh, gradient. Uh, in principle, it can be anything because uh, uh, primitives just, just handle it as graphic context and it's uh, interpreted as luminance uh, value. So you can put, in principle, everything as transparent. We just support this too at the moment. So uh, some examples for a vector and how it get, can get complicated. Uh, entry red at 0 0.8 means uh, start end colors red. It's not a gradient at all. And we, I have implemented fallbacks so, so that we don't need to render it as, as fallback. So next example, minus 0 0.2 to 0 0.2. So you compute the start color entry uh, linear interpolation. And then I have, you have gradient from 0 to 0 0.2 and single color as the rest. And it just goes on like that. And, and uh, 0 0.5 with three colors shows that the blue is just not used. 
but don't throw it away. It's user input, and if you want to have turnarounds uh, working, uh, just keep it in the background. So uh, moved all of this uh, to tooling classes to have it readily available uh, on all places, uh, you know, AP implementations and the rendering stuff and everywhere. Uh, so I adapted it to our six type of gradients, adaption of primitive decompositions for those gradients to get it renderable. So this was uh, straightforward, but got uh, a little bit complicated because we have just uh, more steps. Uh, I also added a callback lambda to the uh, tooling to create the uh, gradient steps and also changed the primitive renderer so there's no longer uh, something like if necessary, 120 uh, primitives created in single color, but uh, the callback just gets gets called with uh, color and transformation, and you you paint you paint your um, uh, gradient uh, form. So the gradient forms we currently have is just a unit circle and unit rectangle, but we could, in principle, use any form to to draw gradients. So. Um, also necessary adaption of texture transformations. Uh, so this uh, was uh, more challenging. So it's used currently in slideshow, a slideshow filling shapes with it and uh, 3D objects. Uh, so it's uh, just a back transformation from a unit coordinate system zero to one uh, to a color. Um, and it will be important for texture rendering and system dependent renderers because that's what uh, graphic systems use nowadays and you give them you gave them you give them uh, this uh, back transformation function and uh, then it can be done in hardware uh, so I added a small buffering because with multiple color sequences uh, it's expensive mm -hmm. to do it for every pixel, but I just buffered a single entry for, for, the, la for the last uh, part and it had a hit rate of over 99%. So it pretty much has the same speed as before, even with multicolor gradients. So I reduced the number of enums. There were really three different enums to uh, describe our six gradient sh uh, shaped uh, possibilities. Uh, then API changes, Regina already talked about it, very short, uh, we have a color stop, we have a color stop sequence, all stra pretty straightforward, and a gradient 2 derived from uh, the existing gradient which uh, contains, contains the initial, uh, additional color stop sequence, so that's pretty much all what was needed. Um, and adapting all implementations was also, also uh, more challenging again, but I got the API stuff pretty pretty quickly running with spec compatibility in place. So uh, the tooling methods uh, to convert between UNO API format and internal core formats, uh, including any handling, so you don't have to uh, care if it's a gradient or gradient two with the tooling, does, does stuff like that for you. Um, uh, to take care of derived UNO uh, types, so adaptions of UNO API with corrections, fallbacks, all that stuff. So then we get to the more important stuff, OXML import. Um, so there was already uh, import from the basic values in OXML, so I could just build on it. Uh, so called gradient props, uh, so they can now directly be used as a gradient to color stop. Uh, there's this paradigm difference. Microsoft has alpha values uh, directly in the gradient. So if they are used and not all the same, you have to create a color gradient and a transparency gradient on our side and vice versa. So, so uh, Microsoft also has a color intensity, but it has just to be uh, added to the color because our stuff which is similar to it is just in one direction and can just blend against black, uh, completely unusual from my point of view. I don't know why this is in place. Uh, so export, as I already said, Microsoft has it's the other way, they have transparency, so you need to mix it. So it's, it's also not uh, rocket science. So if, if you have a, a 
uh, color gradient and uh, the transparency is a fixed value. You just add the fixed value to every step. If you have a transparency gradient, you do it the other way around. Uh, you build a Microsoft compatible gradient with all the same color and the different uh, uh, transparencies. The only interesting case is really when the two don't match. So uh, in most cases they do match because it was imported from somewhere and it, we, we created it ourselves. But in, in case it doesn't match, yeah, it's also not really complicated. So if you have your color and uh, transparency and you have some color stops and transparency stops, you just have to linearly uh, interpolate uh, fitting values and then you put them together and you have, you have uh, what you need for Microsoft Format. And this works surprising, surprisingly well and uh, solves the problem. So we no longer need the original the grab bag, but it's, it's still there in case. Uh, but we could uh, now remove it more or less. So a uh, small excursion. Microsoft has uh, one more type of gradient, and very interesting, we don't support it yet. Um, it's path related and it just shrinks the polygon. So um, we could do it relatively easy for convex polygons, but not for concavrons. And uh, just for your imagination, it's like a, a building with a, a, a irregular roof. And uh, if you think about how the roof is, is growing, uh, so every, every layer of the roof would be a color step. So that's gets complicated quickly, especially with, when you have round parts included and numerically um, it gets in trouble pretty fast. I once tried that um, 10 years ago, something. So uh, not as easy as it looks. Um, border property. We have a border property. It's also not very useful because it's only on one side of the gradient. <laughs> and on the wrong side for the axial one, uh, but we have to keep that. Um, we can do that now in the gradient stops just by not using zero and one directly, but uh, we have to keep the border. So if someone changes the border, we have to so somehow integrate it. So we cannot just get rid of the border entry, unfortunately. Uh, but I added tooling so, so you can interpret it in both directions. You can create the border from a, a gradient stop vector and vice versa. So we have all tooling we need to uh, export. Uh, so currently we do the extra step and export in ODF with border uh, to be more compatible with old uh, offices. Just looks better. Uh, so thanks go to Regina. She provided completely running prototype. <laughs> so um, she also took over the need definition change stuff and all that. Uh, I slightly adapted it uh, to, to also have it available for the gradient previews. Um, and we added more stuff to uh, import, export, border, axial, and color steps in a compatible way. Um, so, meta file adapted to correctly include stuff, but I think I go over this. You can read this if you want in, in the presentation. So. Uh, one interesting thing, uh, just, just for fun, um, first there was writer, and then uh, Burgess said, let's have draw impress and calc. But the first version of output device could do nothing fancy at all, no gradients, not even um, dashed lines or something. This was all put into an, something called X output device, X is not for interface or something, so just for extended, and it was all implemented there, and later when it was integrated uh, so that the other apps could use uh, the gra nice graphic stuff too, it was transferred to output device, so it was very simple before that step, just as a side note. So SVG M export also adapted. You can just read about it. This was one of the more difficult parts because the code for the export is a little bit mangled and based on uh, meta file stuff. So this was a little bit more complicated. But uh, Regina insisted 
<laughs> and uh, I got it working so far that uh, you really get uh, SVG gradients for the gradient and for the transparency, even if you combine it. So we spare some, some ASCII space in SVG. Um, so we have this gradient steps. This is also um, just something uh, we have uh, to um, reduce a uh, smooth gradient to something like three, four, five steps. I don't know why it's there, uh, who liked it, uh, whatever, but we have it, we have to support it. <laughs> so uh, there's tooling to do so, but uh, if you think about it, you can do that with the uh, color stop uh, gradient uh, completely, so we can now 100% export that stuff. Uh, also not that bad. So PDF export also in the way, graphic format exports, I, I talked about the vector formats, pixel formats, I checked all of them. Most worked out of the box just with uh, adapting the primitive decomposition. Um, not to forget, you also have MTGR, multi-transparency gradient, so there were some adaptions needed for, to, to get the correct alpha channel to the uh, pixel exporters, but was doable. So the point is, we have no UI. All existing UI works, uh, so you can change the start colors, the end color, you can add border, you can change the gradient type uh, as long as you have a multicolor gradient. So where do, you, where do you get it from? You can import it. Uh, we have some in the prototypes, in the area fill dialog, uh, Heiko edits them. And Regina already had a talk yesterday showing some macros creating them. So, but of course, uh, we need a UI in the long term. Um, but I don't, I don't have to do everything. Uh, the core stuff is working, so maybe someone, um, even GSOC or something, could do it because the API is there and everything is working. It's just UI implementation. We will see. Um, I have myself some ideas for the interactive gradient stuff. I uh, don't know how many people even know about it. We have interactive gradients which you can, where you can move the orientation of the gradients and stuff directly with the mouse. Hard to find. Maybe we should offer it more directly. So, done. Multicolor gradient feature complete from the stuff I could do in the core UNO APM exports, um, made it in time and is in the 7.6 release and uh, no catastrophes came up and nothing fired back, so fingers crossed. Uh, uh, to currently work with them, uh, as I said, scripts from Regina, examples, uh, you can copy paste uh, if, you, if you have loaded something, you can also store uh, in the um, prototypes in the area area, in the fill area by adding, using the add button and then can use it for any new shape you create by just applying that and would be a shame to not show some pictures. <laughs> just, uh, just the technical side would be uh, too boring I think. So, just in time. You see on the, on, the, on the left side, I could not resist uh, to also show the 3D functionality. But these are just some gradients I used just for testing. Not, nothing special, nothing fancy. Really not useful, but just to show. Um, more useful, for example, as field style uh, for uh, our, our, te our text, more, more complicated text stuff. Uh, make, makes it uh, quickly more interesting. I don't know if you remember this technical demos from Amiga and stuff like that. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, they used the gradients like that to make their font sets fancy. We could theoretically do that now. And I could not resist and add uh, at least uh, two 3D uh, objects. So of course it also works uh, with, with uh, all the uh, custom shapes uh, from Microsoft. There's one error Regina already sent me when, when you do this one trick, Regina has to, to make the 3D extrusion that somewhere it's, it's the outer border is an error somewhere. I have to hunt that, but all pretty much working. So. That's it. 
questions? Go ahead. Oh, right. What gradients? Yeah, so, uh, many people don't know that. Uh, uh, Regina will show in, in, the, in her next presentation, I think. So there's a mode in draw when you have selected an uh, object which has a fill gradient. There's a, there's a button you can press and you get the interactive gradient tool. It is a little arrow with color boxes at the start and the end and you can drag and drop from the color selector into the color boxes to change the color and you can pick the, the start or the end of the arrow, rotate the gradient and you can uh, put the back or the front depending on the gradient type and make it shorter or longer and you can, uh, for the ones who have X and, X and Y offsets, you can position it freely in the shape. And you can do the same for the transference gradient. <laughs> yeah. How, how, long are you, how long are you working with the office and I can still surprise you? <laughs> You're welcome. More? I can show you later if you want. Okay, thank you very much.